Now that we have learned the truth about Easter, we are going to discover what the Bible teaches about one of the most serious sins that anyone could ever commit, and that is the sin of spiritual adultery. Speaking about spiritual adultery, James writes, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now because of the context of the passage, we can tell that James is not talking about physical adultery here, because that kind of adultery does not involve friendship with the world. No, the adultery that James is speaking of is spiritual adultery. And James is clear that all people everywhere who desire to be friends of the world make themselves enemies of God. Now to understand this biblical concept, we need to recognize when James and the rest of the men who penned the apostolic scriptures wrote about the world, they used the Greek word cosmos. And when this word cosmos is used, with a negative connotation in the Bible, it refers collectively to all of the individuals in the world who disobediently follow the varied lies of Satan while rebelling against the timeless truth of God's holy word. About these two diametrically opposed groups that can easily be distinguished by their obedience to all of the scriptures and the scriptures alone, John writes, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So those who are under Satan's influence make up the world, while those who have been set free from that evil influence by hearing, believing, and obeying the word of God are no longer part of that system. Thus Paul wrote, God be thanked, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Truly sin is disobedience to God's commandments, and righteousness is the opposite of sin. So those who hear, believe, and obey God's word are delivered from slavery to sin and the influence of Satan. Meanwhile, to all of the people who still live in disobedience to the word of God, we can apply the words of Jesus who said, You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. As Jesus pointed out, Satan is the father of all lying and the whole world is under the influence of the devil because they believe his lies like Eve did in the garden. Therefore, when the world obeys Satan's deceptions instead of the truth of God's word, it proves that they are still children of the devil. And even while the Holy Scriptures clearly instruct us, to live lives of righteousness and godliness, the Bible also teaches that the world is hell-bent towards sin and destruction. So our brother John concluded, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And John also declared, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. 
Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So in this raging battle between truth and deception, the cosmos, or satanic world system, represents those who are fighting against the Messiah because they are still following the devil's lies that lead them to violate the laws of their Creator. About this Paul explains, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So, we once were part of the world system that follows the lies of Satan, and we were dead in sin because we walked in rebellion to God's law along with the rest of the world. Plus, when we lived in that way, we were really allowing Satan to condemn us to hell because his lies always seek to justify people continuing to live for the lusts of their flesh as sons of disobedience and children of wrath. Thus, in Ephesians, Paul described the current state of every person who walks according to the lusts of their flesh. And only when they repent and decide to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord instead of those lusts will they be made alive as children of God. Truly this is how we were made alive by Jesus, and this is how every member of Satan's world system of lies must be made alive in Christ. Meanwhile, because we are now on the opposing side of the world in this war between God's truth and Satan's lies, Jesus explained, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Yes, there is truly hostility between the two sides of this war. The people of the world who live according to the lies of Satan hate those who live according to God's word. And those who live according to God's word hate the lawless actions of the people of the world. In fact, we should always be tormented day after day, like righteous Lot was, by the sin we see all around us. You see, Peter proved the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment by writing. God delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So if we think, like Lot did, and hate all lawlessness, we will never commit spiritual adultery and side with the world in this cosmic war against the truth of God's word. And this is why, in a very similar way, John wrote, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Friends, it is spiritual adultery to love the things of this world. As James said earlier, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship 
with the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So unless we want to become God's enemies, we must keep our distance from the things of the world. But how can we learn to do this? Well, Paul explains, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul commands us not to let the world system that follows Satan's lies conform us in any way. Instead, we should offer our bodies as living sacrifices by allowing the Word of God to transform our minds. And if we honestly approach God's Word, ready to become a living sacrifice to God by obeying His Word, God will reveal His good, acceptable, and perfect will for us. And this is wonderful news, because as we read earlier, he who does the will of God abides forever. Plus, this should remind us of how Jesus taught, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You see, knowing and doing the will of God is what life is really about. And if we know and do the will of God, we become part of God's family through the blood of Jesus our Savior. This is why Jesus said, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now I ask you, could we call any father a good father if he didn't make it clear to his children what his will was for them to obey? What would you call a father who punished his children for things he never instructed them to avoid? Or worse yet, what would you call a father who punished his children for not doing things he never clearly told them to do? Obviously, fathers who refuse to clearly instruct their children regarding what things they should avoid and what things they should practice would be bad fathers. But good fathers teach their children to avoid evil and do good. And our Heavenly Father is most certainly a good father in every sense of the word. He has clearly revealed his will to us, and he has clearly instructed us in what is good and what is evil. Thus with the psalmist we proclaim, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Now, did you notice that this verse of Psalm 40 connects God's will and God's law together? Yes, David understood that God's will is revealed in God's law. And Paul understood that fact too. In Romans, Paul wrote to the Jews, Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. And later in that same letter, Paul wrote, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. So David took delight in doing God's will, and Paul took delight in God's law. And both David and Paul clearly connected God's will and God's law in their inspired writings. So what aspects of the Bible do you think can transform and renew our minds so that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? If you guessed the law of our God, you would be correct. After all, the Bible clearly states, the law of the Lord is perfect, 
converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And this is why God said He sent His Holy Spirit to us. The Holy Spirit came to write God's law on our hearts and minds and cause us to walk in His statutes. But false teachers quench the Spirit when they wrongly teach God's people to despise parts of God's holy word, especially parts that the apostles and disciples of our Lord never set aside or contradicted in any way. And you can be sure that if God wanted us to keep days like Easter or Christmas, we would be able to find instructions for those days in the Holy Bible. But their absence proves they are not the will of God for His people. Instead, we see God clearly and exclusively laying out instructions for Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. And those instructions were never abrogated, contradicted, or replaced in any way. Now, with these facts established, please remember each passage we have seen so far shows us plainly there are only two sides to choose from in this war. The side of the world that follows the lies of Satan that contradict the Word of God, and God's side, made up of the children of God who faithfully follow the truth of God's Word. And you can be sure that God's children know that their Father's instructions are never dangerous, bad, or wrong. And we must remember how Jesus warned, the world will hate all those who follow the will of God as members of God's kingdom. Plus the Spirit at work in the sons of disobedience, who is Satan himself, will constantly try to lead God's children back into worldly thinking. Therefore, we need to test all things by the Word of God to keep learning about the acceptable will of God that we should follow in all things, especially in our worship of God. And now that we understand that this is the real spiritual warfare we are involved in during this present evil age, we should ask, why is friendship with the world compared to adultery? And the answer is found in biblically defining the word adultery. The word adultery is always found within the biblical context of either marriage or betrothal. And betrothal is the same as our modern term, engagement. So, adultery occurs when someone who has entered into a marriage covenant by either being married or betrothed leaves the marriage covenant to be intimate with someone else. If a person cheats on their fiancé or their spouse, they commit adultery. But if a person is intimate with someone before entering a marriage covenant, they commit fornication. Both sins lead to hell, by the way. Unless the fornicator or adulterer repents and surrenders to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But the word adultery in the Bible is referring to the violation of a marriage covenant. So why is it spiritual adultery for the follower of Jesus Christ to develop even a friendship with the world? Well, it is because they have entered into a spiritual marriage covenant with Jesus Christ and they are spiritually cheating on Him when they grow fond of the things of this world. Paul once wrote, 
For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, as the church, we are the chaste and pure virgin bride of Jesus Christ, and we are waiting for our bridegroom to come to officially enter our marriage to him. So because we are in a very solemn marriage covenant with Jesus as his betrothed wife, we commit spiritual adultery when we get comfortable with the things of the world in our lives. And in direct contrast to people being comfortable with the compromise and sin of this present evil world, John prophetically writes, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Yes, righteous, faithful obedience to God's word prepares the saints to stand before Jesus in fine, clean, bright, white linen garments. But lukewarm compromises with the sinful tendencies of this world will leave a person standing in the shame of their nakedness like the people of the church of Laodicea. So with this foundational apostolic understanding of spiritual adultery in mind, let's go back to the law and the prophets to see how spiritual adultery was most commonly described before Jesus came. The prophet Jeremiah recorded, The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. God said that the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah both played the harlot, and this was in reference to the sin of idolatry, which is the same as spiritual adultery. Plus we also see the connection between idolatry and spiritual adultery or spiritual harlotry in the law of our God. In Exodus, at the same time, God gave Moses his Ten Commandments on a second set of tablets. God spoke about the nations Israel would conquer, saying, You shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, and make sacrifices to their gods, and one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. To keep his people from ever playing the harlot with false gods, which is the same as spiritual adultery, the Creator told his people to completely destroy anything that ever had to do with the false idols of the pagan nations around them. They were to destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. And when God describes himself as jealous, by the way, that is not a bad thing. You see, 
It's not wrong to be jealous after something that belongs to you. It's only wrong to be covetous of the things that belong to someone else. Thus, because Israel entered into a spiritual marriage covenant with God at Sinai, in his righteous jealousy, the Lord told them to completely destroy anything that was ever associated with the false gods of the pagan nations. And since marriage is still a picture of our relationship with Jesus, just as it was a picture of God's relationship with Israel, we must understand that anything that was ever associated with another god is an abomination to our glorious Creator. Imagine your spouse celebrating your birthday every year on the actual birthday of one of their former lovers. Or what if your spouse hung pictures and reminders of their former lovers all over the walls of your house? How would it make you feel to see your spouse ignore your actual birthday and your other important anniversaries together, all while they intentionally celebrated the birthdays and anniversaries of their former partners. That is how our God views pagan worship rituals that were formerly associated with demonic idolatry. So when his people mix the idolatrous practices of the pagans into their worship of him, he absolutely hates it to the very core of his being. Over and over again, to prevent this terrible type of spiritual adultery from happening, our Lord repeated, You shall utterly destroy all of the places where the nations which you shall dispossess served their gods, on the high mountains, and on the hills, and under every green tree. And you shall destroy their altars. Break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods, and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. You see, our worship of God is the most intimate connection we ever make with him. And when we incorporate pagan idolatry into the worship of the one true God, it is a constant reminder to him of his enemies, demonic enemies who competed against him for his bride's love and attention. And I hope we can see God never told Israel that they could keep those idolatrous practices as long as they no longer meant idolatrous things to them. No, our God warned, you shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Truly the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Thus, only a fool justifies adopting pagan worship rituals into the worship of the Most High God by saying it is right in his own eyes. But the wise man or woman seeks the never-changing counsel of God to find his will regarding how he is to be worshipped. And that counsel makes it clear, if we don't ever want to provoke our God, whose name is jealous, to wrath like Israel and Judah did, we better flee from all of our former associations with pagan idolatry. We need to utterly destroy the things in our lives that were clearly associated with the worship of other gods at any time in history. And we must never worship the Lord our God, with such things. That is why we see in Acts 
many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Even in the New Covenant, our God will not share his bride with Satan or his demons who pose as gods in this world. And Paul warns, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Friends, the Almighty has declared, Take heed to yourself, that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. Therefore the Bible declares plainly, over and over again, that God hates the way the pagans worship their false deities. And he has specifically forbidden his people from imitating the ways of the Gentiles. Plus, because God said he hates those things, it really doesn't matter if we see them differently than he does, we still need to put them out of his church. Please remember, there are only two sides in this war. And anything that we can't find in the Bible regarding our worship of God is from the world. Plus, friendship with the world makes us the enemy of God. And the scriptures plainly record God has never, ever allowed anyone in all of biblical history to worship him according to what was right in their own eyes. Instead, God has always prescribed exactly how he is to be worshipped in his word. For example, God told Moses about the tabernacle. See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Even Moses was not free to design things as he saw fit. He was specifically told to make everything involved in the worship of God exactly as he was instructed. Therefore, even the tabernacle and its instructions reveal, we are never permitted to invent our own forms of worshiping God, especially when the question is, can we incorporate pagan elements into that worship? The histories of Nadab and Abihu, Uzzah, Cain, Jeroboam, and many more were included in the Bible to caution us against inventing our own forms of worship for the one true God who is forever exalted above all false gods. And God is seeking people to worship him in spirit and in truth, according to his word, in spirit because they truly love him for who he really is, and in truth because they worship him as he has instructed them to in his word. So, instead of being conformed into the pagan practices of worship that sprang up from ancient forms of idolatry and paganism, we must be transformed by the renewing of our minds as we search the scriptures daily to see what the perfect, approved, unchanging will of God actually is. And now that we see how God himself labels the incorporation of pagan holidays and traditions into his worship as spiritual adultery, I need to explain that even days the world around us celebrates that don't seem to have any pagan idolatrous roots still have a negative effect on the true worship of our God 
and here's why. Imagine that your Heavenly Father specifically painted eight magnificent paintings just for you. And as he gave them to you, he explained that those eight special paintings were intentionally designed by him to constantly remind you of his glorious love and his amazing plan of redemption. Then imagine that after your Heavenly Father gave you those very special and divinely crafted paintings, he clearly instructed you to gaze at them on a regular basis to keep your love burning brightly for him. In fact, he warned you several times not to ignore them, not to hang other paintings he did not paint beside them, and not to forget what each painting meant. But later, when you forgot your Heavenly Father's clear instructions, you began to hang several other forged paintings in among the paintings God gave you. And pretty soon your wall was overflowing with beautiful artwork, some divine originals, and some were beautiful forgeries. But next imagine that you somehow forgot which ones were the original, valuable, and special paintings your Heavenly Father lovingly painted for you. You no longer spent your time exclusively admiring the paintings that your Creator and Redeemer had painted for you, paintings that were specifically designed to help you grow in your faith and love Him more and more. But instead, the bright colors and flashy scenes of the forgeries distracted you, and you began to prefer the forgeries more than you even admired your Heavenly Father's special gifts to you. First, how do you think that would make Him feel? But second, consider this. What if the messages hidden in your Heavenly Father's original paintings became a faint memory? And without those messages, your love for Him grew dull and cold. Soon the reasons why you were drawn to love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength were forgotten. And you found your love for the things the forgeries presented growing uncontrollably. You see, the eight special paintings that our Heavenly Father has painted for you and I are His biblical holy days that he himself described in Leviticus chapter 23. And those paintings not only recorded the holiest moments of creation in the first covenant, they also record the holiest moments of the new covenant too. Yes, each of those holy days carries a reminder of all that our Heavenly Father has done for us so that we will fall deeper and deeper in love with Him each time we remember those special historical days. And our Heavenly Father designed us. He designed those days, and He had a specific, loving purpose in mind when He issued those eternally holy paintings. The Sabbath reminds us of God's loving act of creation. The Passover reminds us of His loving act of sacrifice. Unleavened bread reminds us that love never harbors the leaven of sin, because love is the fulfillment of God's law. And first fruits reminds us of all of the wonderful things we will inherit after following our risen Savior faithfully to the promised land. Pentecost reminds us that God's law is the very definition of love, and God's love has been poured out in our hearts when His law was written there by the Holy Spirit. And the day of trumpets reminds us that our Beloved will return at the great sound of the last trumpet to reap the harvest of the earth. 
The Day of Atonement reminds us that He will cleanse the world of all unrighteousness and sin in order to be one with His bride forever. And the Feast of Tabernacles reminds us that we will live forever with our Savior in a glorious kingdom of life, love, and His eternal law. These true paintings, painted by the Creator Himself, are holy because of who created them and what they actually focus our attention on. But all of the holidays of the world around us cannot be found in the Holy Bible because they were invented by man. At best, they are forgeries that take our focus off of God's true holy days, and at worst, they are clear forms of spiritual adultery that will provoke the fiery anger of our jealous Heavenly Father. Sadly, when people hear for the first time the origins of man-made holidays like Sunday, Christmas, and Easter, they often say, but that's not what it means to me. Or even I don't think about the pagan origins of those traditions when I celebrate those holidays. But today we have clearly learned from the Bible itself. It does not matter what those days mean to you. What matters is what they mean to God. We are in a marriage covenant with Jesus Christ, and we are not free to dabble in the things of this world while we claim to be in that covenant with Him. In fact, if we do, the Bible warns we will make ourselves an enemy of God. So to avoid lukewarmness and worldliness in our walk with Jesus Christ, we must always ask one important question. To avoid falling into the sin of spiritual adultery. And that question is, what is the origin of the teaching, holiday, tradition, custom, practice, or term I am considering incorporating into my worship of God? When considering a teaching, the question is, what is the origin of the teaching? And did it come from the Bible? or from man. When considering a holiday, the question is, what is the origin of the holiday, and did it come from the Bible, or from man? When considering a tradition, the question is, what is the origin of the tradition, and did it come from the Bible, or from man? And so on. But we must use this simple question to test all things, to see if they originated in the Word or in the world. If we can find the teaching, holiday, tradition, custom, practice, or term in the Word, and it was prescribed by God, then it is a kingdom principle, and it is approved by God for His worship. But if the origin of a teaching holiday, tradition, custom, practice, or term traces back to the pagan idolatry of the world, then it is from the world, and it must never be brought into the worship of the one true God. The 66 books of the Bible then actually become the sole authority for our faith and practice. They become the litmus test for all of the things we do in our lives, especially in regards to worship and tradition. And if we do Bible things in Bible ways, we will not find ourselves committing spiritual adultery against God and playing the harlot like Israel and Judah did. This is one very important way. God's biblical feasts are part of our spiritual sanctification that comes from walking after the Holy Spirit in obedience to God's Word. But no one can ever be sanctified in this way until they accept the eternal authority imparted by God to every verse of the Bible, from the very first Hebrew word of Genesis to the very last Greek word of Revelation.